I decided to do something a little bit different for this week's album rankings and I'm gonna focus on the year 1987 the peak where all the hard rock heavy metal albums came out so I don't want to waste any time let's get to the list coming in at number 14 is Grim Reaper's Rock You to Hell released in September of 1987 it would be the band's final record for the next 30 years until 2016's Walking in the Shadows under the name Steve Grimmett's Grim Reaper. It would be the last to feature Nick Bocott on lead guitars, Dave Wanklin on bass guitars, and Mark Simon on drums. Grim Reaper gained brief mainstream and critical and commercial success with Rock You to Hell due to the regular airplay of Rock You to Hell on MTV's Headbangers Ball and a lot of album-oriented rock stations. I love the songs like Rock You to Hell, Night of the Vampire, Lust for Freedom, When Heaven com Comes Down, and Wasted Love. It's pretty, it's pretty damn good record, to be honest with you. Next. Coming in at number 13 is Fraley's Comet, which is Ace Fraley's second solo record. He was the former lead guitarist of KISS, and it was Ace's first studio outing since leaving KISS in 82. He had formed his solo band in 84, and went on tour with them, performing KISS classics and some new material of his own. The lineup for Fraley's Comet when it came down to recording was Ace on lead and rhythm guitars and lead and backing vocals, Todd Howarth on rhythm and lead guitars, keyboards and lead vocals, John Regan on bass guitar, and Anton Fegg on drums. An additional musician was Robert Savino on keyboards. There were two songs that really stood out, one of them being Rock Soldiers, which was the album opener, which I kind of liked, and uh, Into the Night, a major hit single for Ace when it reached number 27 on the Billboard Mainstream Rock Charts. The song was originally written and recorded by Russ Ballard on his self-titled 1984 record. He, Russ Ballard also composed Fraley's top 20 single, New York Groove. Next, Coming in at number 12 is King Diamond's Abigail. Abigail is the second studio record from King Diamond, and it was the group's first concept album. Released on June 15, 1987. These concept album tells a story about a young couple named Miriam and Jonathan LaFay moving into an old mansion that LaFay himself had inherited. This would be a popular topic for my future album review at series, but... I like the songs Family Ghost, The Seventh Day of July 1777, and The Black Horseman. Next, at number 11 is Sabotage's fourth studio record, Hall of the Mountain King, produced by Paul O'Neill. It was recorded in a record plant in New York City, released on September 28, 1987. Around this time, Sabotage was trying to find themselves with a conceptual progressive heavy metal style. And it was because of Paul O'Neill's influence that pushed for this idea. A lot of songs came from it, like the title track, the instrumental prelude to Madness, 24 Hours Ago, Beyond the Doors of the Dark, Legions, White Witch, and Strange Wings. That would also lead to them releasing future concept albums such as Street to Rock Opera in 1991 and their next record being 1989's Gutter Ballet. Next, coming in at number 10 is Kiss's 14th studio record Crazy Nights. Released on September 21st, 1987. Produced by Ron Nevison. It featured the songs Crazy Crazy Nights, The Power Ballad, Reason to Live, and Turn On the Night. A relatively high number of songs came from Crazy Nights that were performed live during its support tour. But during and especially immediately following the tour, most of the songs were dropped and never performed again. Only the songs Crazy Crazy Nights was retained in their set list for the Hot in the Shade tour. Followed by a couple of years later. It was dropped after that tour and would not return for nearly 20 years until the Sonic Boom Over Europe tour. 
This makes the album one of the least represented in the band's entire catalog. I don't even understand why. Until years later, it was probably because Kiss took a different approach in cre creating Crazy Nights to turn around their image after they had a downfall in their musical careers due to experimentation of the band's music genre and the loss of their two prime members, Peter Chris and Ace Fraley. And they also had to go through new management as well since they recorded their last record, Asylum. I always thought that this, this was an underrated Kiss album because of Crazy Crazy Nights, Hella High Water, When Your Walls Come Down, Reason to Live, Turn On the Night, and the album closer, Thief in the Night. Very, very, very underrated Kiss album. Next. At number 9 is Dio's fourth studio record, Dream Evil. Released on July 21st, 1987, it featured former Rough Cut members Craig Goldie and Claude Schnell, guitarist and keyboardist respectively. And it includes the singles All the Fools Sailed Away and I Could Have Been a Dreamer. Dream Evil was the last Dio album to feature a mascot named Murray on the cover. And it was also the last to feature drummer Vinny Abisay until 1994's Strange Highways. It also was the last album to feature bassist Jimmy Dane until Magica in 2000. It also marked Claude Chanel's final appearance with Dio. I like the songs Dream Evil, Sunset Superman, All the Fools Sailed Away, I Could Have Been a Dreamer, and Naked in the Rain. I thought this was a very underrated Dio album. I don't know why Dio hated it so much, but as far as I'm concerned, this was still a good album regardless. Next. At number 8 is Dawkins' fourth studio record, Back for the Attack. Released on November 2nd, 1987, produced by Neil Kernan, who happens to, by the way, have produced Dawkins' previous record, along with Michael Wagner, called Under Lock and Key. Back for the Attack was certified gold and platinum in early 1988, and is the band's best-selling album reaching number 13 on the U.S. Billboard album charts, remaining there for 33 weeks. I like the hit singles Dream Warriors, Burning Like a Flame, Heaven Sent, and of course the instrumental Mr. Scary. That was written by both George Lynch and Jeff Pilsen. Awesome record, by the way. Next, coming in at number 7 is White Lion's second record, Pride. It featured two top ten hits, such as Wait and When the Children Cry. The recording process of the record took six weeks, and it was produced by Michael Wagner. Wait was released as a single on June 1st, 1987, but did not make waves until MTV began airing the music video in January of 88, seven months after its release, pushing the single to number eight on the Billboard Hot 100. In August of 1988, more than a year after the album's release, Tell Me was released as a music video and hit number 58. And the third single was a gentle acoustic ballad called When the Children Cry, made it all the way to number three. Again, with heavy MTV rotation of the music video, the album peaked at number 11 on the album charts and would go double platinum. The Pride Tour, I saw them opening for such acts as Fraley's Comet, Aerosmith, Ozzy Osbourne, Kiss, and even ACDC. I like the songs Wait and When the Children Cry. Everything else on the album can just kiss my ass. Next. Coming in at number 6 is Great White's third record, Once Bitten. Released on June 17, 1987 through Capitol Records, it became a commercial success, selling more than a million records in the U.S. alone, being platinum in April of 88. Known for its songs such as Rock Me, Save Your Love, All Over Now, and Lady Red Light, this has to be one of the best Great White albums out there. I ranked it number two when I did my album rankings on them uh, not that long ago. Probably two weeks ago, maybe. Again, it's known for songs like Save Your Love, Rock Me, All Over Now, and Lady Red and Light. Next, we now reach the top five and I begin with Motley Crue's Girls, Girls, Girls. Released on May 15th, 1987. The album contained the hit singles, which is Girls, 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 You're All I Need, and the MTV staple favorite, Wild Side. It was the band's final collaboration with producer Tom Worman, who had produced albums like Shot of the Devil and Theater of 
Theater of Pain. Like those albums, Girls, Girls, Girl would achieve quadruple platinum status and would reach number two on the Billboard 200. It would also mark the change to a blues rock influence sound, which was meant to a positive reception. According to the issue of Georgia Strait, he applauded Mick Mars' guitar for being featured more prominently in the final mix than it had on the previous record, Theater of Pain. Call it their best work since Too Fast for Love. The publication said that the album has recaptured some of the most excitement work since Too Fast for Love on, Dan on Dancing on Glass, Five Years Dead, and the title track, which sports a catchy guitar riff a la Aerosmith's Draw the Line. I like the songs Girls, 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 Wild Side, and You're All I Need. Didn't care for the rest of them. Next, at number four is Guns N' Roses' first record, Appetite for Destruction. Released on July 21st, 1987, the band initially received little mainstream attention, and it was not until the following year that Appetite became a commercial success, after the band toured and received significant airplay with the singles Welcome to the Jungle, Sweet Child of Mine, and Paradise City. The album went on to pick at number one in the US 200 charts, and it became the seventh best-selling album in the United States as well as the best-selling debut album, with over 30 million copies sold worldwide, and is one of the best-selling albums globally. I gotta be honest with you, I always liked Appetite for Destruction more than I did the Use Your Illusion records that they would come out with years later, because of the songs like Welcome to the Jungle, It's So Easy, Night Train, Mr. Brownstone, Paradise City, My Michelle, and, of course, Sweet Child of Mine. And of course, it, it deserves the re recognition it gets. Next, coming in at number three is Death Leopard's Hysteria, released on August 3rd, 1987, produced by Robert John Mutt Lang. Much like Guns N' Roses' Appetite for Destruction, this album would take a while before it would sell and would reach number one in the Billboard album charts. Thanks to the success of hit singles like Pour Some Sugar On Me, Love Bites, Armageddon It, the title track, Women, Animal, and Rocket. But there was one song on there that wasn't a hit, a hit single, but it was one of my favorite tracks on the album. It was called Gods of War. This would actually be the last album for Steve Clark because he would tragically die in January of 1991. I think Def Leppard's Hysteria is like rock, a hard rock version of Michael Jackson's Thriller. If you know what I mean. Next. Coming in at number two is Aerosmith's ninth studio record, Permanent Vacation. Released by Geffen Records on August 25th, 1987. Produced by Bruce Fairbairn. May he rest in peace. They had three hit singles like Do Looks Like a Lady, Angel, and Ragdoll. It was the first to employ songwriters outside the band instead of featuring songs solely composed by them. This came at the suggestion of John Kalligner, an executive for Geffen Records. He also pushed the band to work with producer Bruce Fairbairn, who remained with them until the next two records, Pump and Get a Grip. I like the album for songs like Dude, Ragdoll, Angel, and Hangman's Jury, and of course the Beatles cover, I'm Down. It reached number 11 on the Billboard 200 and went quintuple platinum. That means 5 million units in America alone. Next. And at number one is White Snake's self-titled record. Released on March 23rd, 1987 in the U.S. March 30th in the U.K. 1987. And I gotta be honest with you, I recently covered this on one of my album review episodes. And, I, and it has every right to be my favorite album of 1987. Because of such hit singles such as Give Me All Your Love. Is This Love, Here I Go Again, and Still in the Night. It reached number two on the Billboard 200 and sold 8 million records in America alone. And went platinum in the UK as well. Here's a quick recap of what I've ranked in the year of 1987 as far as album rankings go. I'm thinking of making the weekly thing out of this until I have enough material to go back to the format that I had 
between episodes one and episode six. But I'm thinking of making this a regular thing for the time being, ranking favorite albums of each year. Those are just my opinions, so what are yours? Please like, comment in the comment section below, like and subscribe to my videos. I'm JCP1977, and I'm out of here.